Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm going to follow up and build off what Florian said uh, in terms of what's happening globally and what's that therefore implying for us in India. Uh, what I'm going to share is also going to be available in the report that we publish. Uh, uh, you'll have copies of that outside uh, shortly. Uh, I'm going to talk about four things today. Number one is uh, the performance of the Indian chemical industry. We like taking a market back performance and its consistent uh, value creation. Uh, number two, uh, Florian talked about some global trends. I'm going to take some of them and contextualize them for India. Uh, number three, I'm going to talk about investable themes. And interestingly, uh, uh, a lot of people have talked about the import-export imbalance. We're actually going to look at that as a lens of opportunities for the country. And the last is a, a short charter for industry players. So on the first point, which is value creation, the Indian chemical industry has outperformed both the global markets, uh, the global chemical industry, and the Indian markets. And just as Florian did, I've actually taken three time horizons. We've taken 2006 to 2019. In that, if you see, the Indian chemical industry returned 15%. This is total return to shareholders. Uh, chemicals, all chemicals globally was 8%. Uh, the world market was 6%, and the Indian market was 5% in this period. If you take a shorter horizon, 13 to 19, that continued. Uh, but if you come closer to home, and I've taken a three-year period here, 2016 uh, December to 2019 December, uh, actually, the Indian chemical industry's performance is reduced. It still continues to outperform, but it's obviously reduced a bit. Um, as we looked at it, it was also interesting for us to look at the performance of the industry relative to some of the uh, upstream and downstream segments, right? So if you look at the upstream, which is metals mining and oil and gas, and you look at downstream, which is consumer products, automotive, pharmaceuticals, and construction chemicals, um, again, in the same time frames, very clearly in 2006 to 19, in that time frame, the industry has outperformed both the upstream and downstream. If you take the 13 to 19 time frame, it has really outperformed the industry, and we saw that in the valuations and the multiples that the chemical industry started getting. And if you take the last three-year period, actually it's now not outperforming as much as it historically has, especially if you put consumer products and oil and gas into perspective. Now, what's driven, on average, this outperformance over the last uh, 14, 13, 14 years, and if you take the last three years? Right? What you see here is four listed companies uh, indexed to 100 from 2007, a plotting of the growth of revenue, EBITDA, and at the bottom, multiples, EV by EBITDA. Right? And if you look at this, um, the performance from 2015 to 19, there was a huge growth in the EBITDA, the dark blue line of the industry. So the cumulative EBITDA of the industry has actually grown at a much faster pace than the top line's absolute growth. And in addition, sometime in 2013, 14, 15 is when the market started recognizing the potential of the chemical industry and re-rated the multiples. So if you look at the multiples, they jumped from an average of 10, 11, 12 to now an average of 20, 19 to 20, which is what the industry has been trading at. Right? That's been part of the reason for the value creation. Now, the reason that the market has given the industry this multiple is also because they expect high growth and the outperformance in margins has been well appreciated. So that's a bit of the performance story of the industry as we look backwards. As we move forward, let's just spend a few minutes on what the global trends mean for us. I'll start with the first one, and uh, Bartha, you set me up well for this one, which was the oil to chemicals one. It's very clear that global oil, stream, uh, oil and gas majors are moving towards uh, downstream opportunities. We expect 63% of fuel conversion to go towards chemicals or petrochemicals, and peak oil demand is anywhere between 2035 and 2040. Um, it's very clear that there is going to be a focus on petrochemicals in India. Uh, there has been uh, a lot of announcements over the last two, three years that we've seen. And we do believe that we do have to get self-sufficient. And I'll talk about this in the third section. But our imports have consistently grown from in just petrochemical intermediates. I'm not even talking about all petrochemicals. From 6 billion in 2013 to now 15 billion. And are on track to become 25 billion of imports by 2025. Yeah. So there's a real opportunity with now uh, demand evident on petrochemical intermediates. Uh, the second we all talk about is the changing dynamics in China. What does this mean for us? Is this long-term or short-term impact? Uh, we know the structure is changing in China. They've tightened environment norms. They have uh, uh, changed the financial structure for chemical companies. We believe that in the long term, only few players will benefit, uh, and those will be players who are actually able to use this and get scale. In the short term, it has benefited a lot of the players. But we should be cognizant of the fact that the Chinese chemical industry had significant overcapacity, 
has consolidated and has got players which are even much larger than what they were historically, right? So we have a window of opportunity. It's a small window of opportunity to capitalize and either get scale or we will miss out uh, from the disruptions that we see in China. Um, uh, Florian talked about deglobalization. Uh, we had all thought that globalization was an irreversible trend. It has been reversed. It is, uh, there is heightened protectionism that we've seen. Uh, we are seeing opportunities from it. These opportunities we think are more sustainable because people will de-risk their supply chains. So we are expecting more and more uh, customers to start looking at India as a longer term, more reliable alternative to China. What that means in terms of imports and exports, I'll talk about. Um, consolidation for scale, we are seeing, we saw a huge wave of consolidation uh, about uh, two, three years back. Uh, Everyone's in the process of the mergers and integration. We expect the wave of consolidation to continue. And I think the only point I would make on this as implication for us is scale will matter even more for Indian companies. I think being subscale will not allow us to win in the global market and the opportunities that are going to present for us. Um, digital for efficiency and productivity, it's no longer a nice topic to talk about. On average, companies are getting 300 to 500 basis points from it. We are early in our journey. We have maximized, in my view, in most cases, the EBITDA performance we can get out of functional excellence. There is now opportunity to go on the next S-curve of capturing through digital levers. And I think on sustainability, it is now an imperative. It is not a buzzword. I think while there is an opportunity and we talk about new products, bioproducts, et cetera, I think there's also a real risk. And uh, companies that are not actively thinking about sustainability as a strategy to differentiate will actually start destroying long-term shareholder value. Because customers are demanding it, and it is core to what will differentiate players who are focusing in on it versus not. So more than just upside, I also see real downside with sustainability now for us. So those are the six trends uh, that Florian talked about and our take on the implications for the Indian chemical industry. Uh, let's therefore now move to the investable themes for us. I just want to start with this chart, which is uh, the macro view on our economy on GDP. If we look back 30 years, right, and obviously we're going through a real shock at this point with uh, pretty low growth, but if you look at a 30-year view, we've had many busts, right? And no growth cycle has lasted more than four or five years for us. And so if you put 2014 to 2018, 19 in perspective, uh, the only large long run like that we had was 2004 to 2008, right? So the reason I'm sharing this is, I, and I'm not going to get into our fundamentally strong demographics, et cetera, we've heard that a lot. They are we fundamentally do have the demographics, and I think our long-term view will continue to remain strong. I think the question shifts, therefore, to while our long-term uh, view will remain strong, the domestic demand will stay good, what else can we do? So what we did is we studied the imports and exports, and we talk a lot about it, but I was also personally surprised at the quantum of uh, the uh, opportunity or deficit. So if you look on the export side, right, chemicals, if you exclude oil products, is the second largest import item. It's the third overall, if you include oil, it's the, third, it's the second largest if you exclude. So it's $30 billion of our exports. And I'll talk about what makes that up. And if you look at our imports, it's the fourth largest item. And if you exclude oil, it's the third largest item. It's not very far from the other ones. It's not like there's a huge difference. Right? There's 46 billion versus machinery at 52 versus precious stones and metals at 65. So it is a very, very large piece of the economic uh, trade balance. And that trade balance, if you take uh, a view from 2010 to 2018, it has not really changed much. It's roughly stayed the same. So it's been, there's been about a 15%. And we see it currently based on canal announced capacities remain the same. What's interesting to me is if you look at the makeup of this, right? So if you look at the exports, 55% of our exports are specialty chemicals, right? Which means that there is something that we're doing right in that space. Because typically, the specialty chemicals exports require you to be close to your end customer. But we have been able to produce products which are differentiated at lower cost and use technical marketing to go out there and capture global share, right? So this is really an opportunity, and there are more segments that we can do this in, and I'll talk about which those segments are. On the import side, um, if you look at it, actually, Petchem Intermediates is the largest, which is about 30%, so almost $14, 15000000000 billion of this. And then there's Polymers, which is another 13%, and Petchem, which is 8%. What's interesting to me, and I didn't realize this uh, till uh, almost last night, in 2015, we'd published a report on becoming self-sufficient on pet chem intermediates. At that time, in 2013-14, our imports were about $6 billion. 
And we'd said by 2025, our pet chem intermediates only imports will be about 25 billion. We're heading exactly for that number now, around that number, 24, 25 billion, if you take a 8 to 10 percent volume keg over the next five years. Yeah. And based on announced capacities, actually the deficit will continue. So it is an opportunity for us. Um, so therefore, let's look at the pet chem intermediates, right? That is definitely a, a self-sufficiency opportunity for us. There are two buckets of it. There is the first bucket where we have an access to feedstock issue, C1, C2, C6, and some C6 and C4 chains. But there are some which are in the C3, C6 chains, which are also a combination of access to technology and the ability to develop solutions for the Indian market, which are, in my view, more solvable with all players, especially large oil and gas majors, looking at opportunities in this country. Right? Um, we do believe that given the quantum of the imports and exports, this is becoming now a, uh, a matter of uh, significant debate even at a national level. On the export side, if you look at the specialty chemical exports, so what you see here is we've taken nine categories just as an illustration. The global market growth that we've seen in these markets, what is the total global trade flow on this? So for example, intermediates for pharma and API agrochemical, the total global spec chem exports is about 77 to 72 billion. Yeah. The China's share in this is 11%, 17%, 12% of that global export. India's share is four, six, five in categories that we seemingly dominate, which means even there, there's a 3x difference to China. And other categories where there's almost a 12x difference to China, plastic additives, electronic chemicals, we are, there is a push towards making electronics in this country. Now the question is who's going to supply those chemicals? Are we going to supply the chemicals to that industry or is they going to get imported from Korea and other markets? Food and feed additives, nutraceuticals, rubber chemicals, flavors and fragrance. All of these present real opportunities to grow from an exports perspective for us. So those, that's the lens on, as we see opportunity, we see significant opportunity for the industry. Um, the charter for the industry, I have a few minutes left. Uh, we believe three things. Number one, building at scale businesses. Number two, leveraging digital and analytics for the next wave of efficiency. And number three, really thinking about sustainability uh, beyond compliance. On the first one, in terms of broadening footprint, right? So we've seen, and we've just taken examples, right? So there are four types of things we see. Number one is footprint expansion for geographies and customer segments. We know companies like UPL and RT have done that really well. Uh, the second is getting access to cutting edge technologies. People out there are willing to partner. They want access to this market. They want to be able to access uh, opportunities both to export and serve in there. Uh, Atul and Axo did a very interesting deal for, uh, uh, for one of the chemical intermediates. Um, access to alternative and cheaper feedstock. If we aren't being able to get it here, which markets can we go access? We heard the recent Reliance Agnaf deal. And then value chain integration. Uh, we believe that's also a real opportunity to build scale. Um, Chinese companies have actually done that really well. Any product that they dominate, if you look at their cost structures and you put them on a cost curve, they uh, go all the way back to two, three, four steps. So number one, build scale. And these are three or four ways of thinking about how you build scale. Uh, number two is digital. Um, so, um, and the slight digression, because we had to can cancel the session on uh, China because of the uh, situation there, we in the last minute uh, put up a few booths there on experiencing digital. So if you have time, please do have a look at that. As we see now, I think two years back, we couldn't say it with the same assertion, chemical companies were still experimenting with this. Now we see chemical companies globally actually taking this forward. In every single area of value creation that we've historically seen, procurement, manufacturing, supply chain, GNA, sales and marketing. The typical improvement levers that you see here can range from 2 to 3% to 5 to 7%. And if you put it all together, it's 300 to 500 basis points for opportunity. Um, there are four different things, and language always confuses in this, and that's why I've put the themes up there. There is what you call advanced analytics. There is internet of things. There's robotics and automation, and there's process digitization. A large part of the opportunity comes from advanced analytics, which is basically saying you've got a lot of data. We know manufacturing sector has always had a lot of data. Use that data and uh, use advanced analytics techniques to capture value from it, which is reduce further variability. The others are more early, and the adoption of that will depend on the real payback for the individual projects. So that's the second piece. I think the third, uh, as we looked at sustainability topics across organizations uh, uh, globally, especially for chemical companies, three things came up. Energy efficiency, waste management, water management. Those are the three biggest sustainability topics for us. 
Uh, we know the issues with water that we're having in the country. We know the issues with energy. I don't think it's new for us. I think the only thing that I would say here is that uh, what I miss in most of the dialogues I hear is the shift from using it as an opportunity to uh, using it only for compliance to moving it to something with opportunity or de-risking your shareholder value creation.